Hey, good morning. Scott Luton with you here on Veteran Voices. Welcome to today's show. Hey, joining us today, we're going to be talking with a retired senior leader from the U.S. Navy that is doing big things in business, and she's one heck of an interview, so stay tuned for what promises to be an intriguing conversation. Hey, quick programming note before we get started here today. Veteran Voices, of course, is part of the Supply Chain Now family programming, but we couldn't do it without our great friends and partners over at Vets to Industry, which is a nonprofit that is on the move, helping a ton of veterans find the resources they need to get through transition, to get through times times of uh, need, and, and other chapters that we all experience in life. So check out Vets2Industry.com, powerful nonprofit that's taking care of our veterans community. Okay. No further ado, I don't welcome in. Uh, I want to introduce our featured guest here today. Our guest graduated from Boston University with a Bachelor of Arts in History, uh, and right after which she received her commission in the U.S. Navy in a ceremony aboard the USS Constitution. How cool is that? She also holds several advanced degrees, including a Master of Science in Information Management. She spent 30 years in the U.S. Navy, earning the rank of Rear Admiral and accumulating a wide variety of awards and recognition, had about 27 pages at last count uh, of awards and recognition throughout her career. In her last role with the U.S. Navy, this is pretty cool, she served as the Navy Cybersecurity Division Director and Deputy Chief Information Officer on the Chief of Naval Operations Staff. So we all know how much more important that's become in recent years. Now she's a sought-after keynote speaker, author, and consultant. She serves on a variety of organizations, board of directors to include KVH Industries and Protego Trust Company. So joining me in welcoming United States Navy Rear Admiral retired, Danell Barrett. Admiral Barrett, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me today, Scott. It's a real honor to be on your show and to just share some thoughts with you guys. It's gonna be a good conversation. Well, I always love, uh, and thank you for that. Thank you for your time. I always love having a sneak peek of our guests. And I'll tell you, I know it was short. Uh, I think it was about a 30 minute session uh, when you keynoted the big networking vets to industry event, but it was home run stuff and it was no nonsense. And it was clearly been there, done that. And it's practical. And that I'll tell you, we, we, we have no shortage of a need for good leadership advice, but we really need good practical leadership advice. And you bring that in spades. So our listeners are in for a treat. So let's get started. I want to, uh, you know, before we get to the heavy lifting stuff, I want to get, you know, get to know you a little bit better. So tell us, Admiral Barrett, where, where are you from? Where'd you grow up? And, and give us some anecdotes of that upbringing. Yeah, sure. Um, so I grew up in upstate New York, in a town outside of Buffalo called Hamburg. It's just a little town in uh, uh, just, you know, typical suburbia growing up. And it's funny because there wasn't a lot of Navy around there or military. Um, hmm. There's retired, you know, there were retired a lot of Vietnam veterans and things like that, but not a lot of active duty people around and not. Uh, so anyway, um, uh, we used to have two museum ships in the harbor down there, the Sullivans, named after the five Sullivan brothers who died during World War II, mm. and uh, the Little Rock. And so I remember doing an overnight on there for with you know some group at some time where you sleep overnight on the, the museum ship and stuff like that. And I just became really intrigued by that. And so anyway, it kind of it piqued my interest in the Navy at a young age. And I, and I never really, at that point, never wanted to join the Navy or anything. I just thought that was pretty kind of interesting. And so um, when I wanted to go to college, I actually used to do a lot of theater and acting and stuff. And I was thinking of doing oh. that as a profession. Right. But, but then I wanted to serve, I wanted to do some sort of service, whether it was the Peace Corps or the military, whatever, but the military seemed like a really uh, noble profession, if you will. And so, um, to just a calling to do a little bit, something different and where you could uh, protect some freedoms and things that we have that are important to us in this country. So I thought, okay, well, let me do that first. And then I could always do the acting thing later, you know. So. <laughs> well, hey, so as you were talking about when you were a child and you were uh, did that overnight stay, was it the ships that were intriguing? Was it the story, the Sullivan Brothers story? What was it that made such a big impression and what you saw and, and kind of took in? Well, it was kind of all of it. And like, I'd never been exposed to that stuff before. And so that's the thing that's important about kids and um, you know, exposing them to a whole bunch of different things, because you just never know what's that one thing that's going to end up being something that they latch on to or have a passion for or whatever. Um, you know, you just, you just don't know what that one thing is. And so the more you can expose kids to when they're little, um, 
whether it's STEM things or, you know, uh, experiences like being on a Navy ship or trips or just conversations with people who might enlighten them on things that they've done and that, that are in the art of the possible. That's really important to spark the imagination of a kid about what they might do. So I think that's, you know. Well important. said, well said. That, that, that's a wonderful point to be made. Um, let's talk about you. So you mentioned acting and, and uh, as, as a early potential path for you. And now coming full circle, I understand that in some of your spare time now, you serve as, as extras in movie productions. Is that right? Yeah, I do. I just started to go back because COVID, you know, I couldn't do it last year because of COVID. But yeah, so I, um, yeah, so I sign up for to be extra in TV and movie and stuff like that. And, you know, you blink, you'll miss me kind of thing, right? I've only done it a couple times now. But um, it's kind of funny because, you know, you know, dumpy lady crossing street number two, I've been preparing for that role my whole life. I mean, you know, that I, I'm like right out of central casting now, you know what I'm saying? And so, and, you know, to be an extra a background actor in movies, I mean, there's no skill required. I mean, you just need to be a mouth breather and have a reliable car to get to work. You know, I mean, the bar is pretty low, right? So, um, but it's, it's really fun because, you know, you show up and you just get to experience a different, something completely different mm. and a different industry. And, it's fascinating to me. I mean, I talk to all the people that are on the set just to find out how they do, you know, the cameraman, the stand-in guy, the guy who does props. I mean, it's just interesting to learn something about something you know nothing about, you know? Fascinating. And I, I bet, yeah, just as you're speaking, uh, just seeing kind of the, the, the craft, the operation, uh, all the people right. involved, what they do, I bet it is intriguing. Um, all right. So I want to transition over now to your time in the U S Navy serving our country. Uh, and I know we're only gonna be able to, to scratch, um, you know, only gonna be able to get the tip of the iceberg here today and in, in, in an hour's time, but you've already spoken a bit to, um, why you joined the military, I think. Um, and, and of course, feel free to add anything else there, but I'd love to, you know, you had so many different roles as, as I've uh, read through your bio a bit and including your, uh, your last role, when it comes to cyber and it's that, that alone is fascinating because if you think back to the time when the Sullivan brothers served or, or even the eighties with, uh, you know, desert storm and, and the first Gulf war, you know, I'm not sure I'm not, I wasn't in those conversations, but, but I'm not even sure cyber was part of the conversation when it comes to fighting wars and, and defending the country for that matter. And so now fast forward to, you know, the late, uh, or the, uh, 20, 18, 2019, kind of where we are now to have, you know, resources invested, leadership invested technology to, uh, to wage war and, 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 and form national security around that aspect. It is absolutely fascinating. So tell us more, you know, whether it's, whether it was um, roles in that, um, in, in that uh, along those lines or previous in your career, what were some of your favorite positions during your service? Well, it's interesting because the, the things that I liked the most were things that challenged me, again, to do things that I aren't inside my comfort zone. Now, when that happens, sometimes it's thrust upon you or sometimes you grab it, right, yourself. But either way, I always find it fascinating um, when something is brand new. And some people don't like that because there's the uncertainty makes them uncomfortable, right? But I see opportunity in the uncertainty. And I love it because, hey, if no one's been there, no one's chaired the course, then I'm going to do it. You know what I mean? I <laughs> you know, so it, it like kind of leaves it a, a little bit open for you to do, be creative or innovative or do something that because people haven't figured it out yet, right? Um, other times, and cyber is a kind of a lot like that. I mean, we're still figuring out a lot in cyber. I mean, it's it's in the age of exponentially accelerating technology, um, it's, it's um, astounding how fast things are changing and transforming um, whole industries. I mean, it, the thing that I like about working in the technology field, and I was not a technologist when I got in the Navy, I couldn't even program my VCR. And now I could program a router. I mean, it's crazy. The things <laughs> the, Navy the, or the military will teach you, you know what I mean? Um, I mean, I was a history major, right? And, and one thing I'll say too, just as an aside is don't discount the liberal arts majors, because one thing I found through my course of my career is that you need people who can write and liberal arts people can write, right? So it's not like you have to be a STEM guy or gal or a liberal arts person. You can do both. And um, uh, actually, my daughter's proof of that. She's a, a professional ballerina, but she got her degree. She got a BS degree. So I call her my scientist in a tutu. So you can encourage kids to do both. Right. But anyway, um, 
I think that in an age of exponentially accelerating technology, there's opportunity there for us to, whether it's cyber or, or internet of things or unmanned vehicles or whatever, there's opportunity there for us to seize and as a leader, look to see, okay, what are those kind of convergent points that can be transformational that you could do something with? So if I use an example um, of like an electronic car, an autonomous vehicle and Uber, right? Each of those things in among themselves is transformational, right? Uber really changed the whole taxi and way you get ride share and, and get around the industry, right? Electric vehicle changes a whole bunch of things about the environment and the, the, how cars are built and how they're, you know, gas stations and things like charging stations, right? All those things in themselves are transformational. But when you combine them together, the point where they converge, now what that really means is that, you know, kids born today will never learn how to drive a car because they'll never need to. They'll never own a car. There won't be pet boys, car insurance, the way we know it, car rental companies. I mean, car dealerships, all these things, you know, five to 10 years from now are going to be either radically different or gone, right? And that makes people like really uncomfortable sometimes. But if you look at the opportunity of that, you know, what that means is I'll walk out of my house in the morning and I will walk up and there'll be some vehicle, whether it's a car or a hovercraft or whatever, picks me up scans the RFID tag in my head or my arm, charges my bank two bucks and knows where I go every day. So it's going to take me to work, right? And if just perhaps I'm going to go to the airport that day, I'm going to say, oh, no, I'm not going to work today. I'm going to the airport. It's going to take me there and charge me $3 or whatever. But my point is those convergent points in technology are transformational, but they're also an opportunity for leaders and people to say, okay, what can I do with that transformation? What can I do? And so the jobs that I've had where I could do to, to do those sort of innovative or try to do those kind of things were much more interesting to me than, um, you know, other stuff. I mean, other stuff is important. I get it. And we all have to do it. You know, people have to write policy in the Pentagon, but it can be soul crushing, right? It's not exactly <laughs> like I wake up in the morning. I'm like, yes, I get to write policy today, right? You know what I mean? So, you know, it's, there's, there's certain jobs. And of course, the jobs that I love the most were the operational jobs. Um, where you're with a team of folks and you've got great sailors and chiefs and, and sometimes civilians working mm -hmm. on those teams where you're deployed on a carrier or, you know, in Iraq or wherever. I just love the deployed environment. And I, of course, you miss your family. Don't get me wrong. But I, I always found those the most um, interesting, the most rewarding. Agreed. And we're going to talk about the people in, in a second. If I could, one more follow-up question on, especially related to cyber. Uh, you know, here at Supply Chain Now and Veteran Voices, of course, we talk a lot about uh, de the Democrat. <laughs> I can never say this. Democratizate. Uh, we're, we're democratizing uh, yes. technology. <laughs> Goodness gracious! I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to go practice that 17 times right on the chalkboard. <laughs> um, and that's a beautiful thing, right? In industries, it really is. Um, I mean, it's fueling uh, and and changing and transforming so many different things. It, it, it's empowering for the consumer. It's fueling startup and, and entrepreneurial um, ventures, which, you know, of course, we can relate to as an entrepreneur. Um, and it's really enabling uh, even large companies that have kind of moved far away from the startup culture to, to reinvent how they saw old and new problems. Now, I'd love to pick your brain on this because my hunch, my assumption is when it comes to national security, all those great trends we're seeing with, with uh, technology for all you know, on, in, the, in the kind of the private sector or the, or the uh, civilian sector also makes it more challenging from national security sector because the bad actors all of a sudden have, have, have are taking advantage of innovations and in technology all the same. Is that, is that accurate? And can you, can you speak to anything there? Yeah, sure. No, it's a great point, Scott. And you're spot on that. Uh, um, so think about how much it costs to build the latest aircraft carrier. Um, the, it was $13 billion. Now that's a lot of firepower. It's a wow. capability. I get it. Um, if I'm an adversary, I'm not going to outspend a, a first world country like the United States on national defense. But you know how much it costs to build a capable hacker? You know, Just to buy the tools, I could buy uh, password cracking tools for about $3. I could buy a whole toolkit on the wow. dark web today for $10. I could buy something that allows me to break into cell phone towers, a really sophisticated something for, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, right? I mean, these things are a leveler for bad guys. It's a, it's a way that they can achieve an effect um, and, and disrupt what we're trying to do or destroy something um, 
without having to spend $13 billion and have all the infrastructure behind that. So you have to have, the nation has to be agile in cyber, um, both in a offensive way, because we're not going to just take punches. You're going to have to give right. punches, right? And General Nagasone is doing great work at US Cybercom with his team over there and all the, the services that are working on that. So the nation's doing really well under his leadership over there. Um, but what I would say is it's a constant and battle. And it's, it's also, uh, it's a cat and mouse game. You know, you're never going to be done. It's going to be always, the minute something good comes out, some bad guy figures out a way to use it for evil. And so, you know, <laughs> even if it's something as, as simple as, you know, uh, a, a relief website for, for a, you know, a, an earthquake or a charity, what do you see the first thing happen after that? Scams, right? Where they're diverting people off and getting their money and it's not going to those people. I mean, so the minute some good technology comes out, whether it's unmanned vehicles or internet of things, and, and you know, in the era of big data too, I mean, it's becomes a, a, a calculus for just, you know, for, for tipping uh, someone's influence. I mean, something like, I'll tell you, I, big data, I love big data, but it kind of scares me. You know, when I turned 53 this year, the first email I got that morning was where to buy the best toenail clippers for seniors. I'm like, really? <laughs> I'm like, that's the email I get? <laughs> you know what I mean, I was like, come on, man. You know what I mean? Why couldn't it be like, this is how seniors can look hot, right? You know, why couldn't it be like that, right? <laughs> it, you know, <laughs> um, and, go ahead, sorry. But, okay, and, so, and like, you know, I, I joke about it, but like, you know, I don't want to be the guy sitting at home, you know, uh, you know, I'm like a sailor. So like, I don't, I don't, I like a pint every now and then, but it's not a pint of Guinness, it's a pint of haagen And so I don't want to get that call from my doctor on Monday morning that says, Hey Barrett, your cholesterol's too high. Lay off the, lay off the haagen And I'll be like, how does he know? And then I'll right. be like, refrigerator, refrigerator saw it go in and not come back out. Right. So it's a dime to me out. So my point is like big data and those kind of things are just as, helpful to us and wonderful, but also an adversary can take advantage of that. Look what happened with disinformation in our election. Look what happened, how easy it is to deep fake something or somebody saying something they didn't say. So again, we just have to be smart about how we use technology and smart about what we see, you know, as consumers of technology and information, don't just believe everything you see. It's caused a lot of divisiveness in our nation. Excellent. Uh, so much goodness in what you shared there. And, and, one of the things it, it, it is a journey with no finish line that can, it's like continuous improvement in industry. There's always, you, you, you can't, yeah, you got to celebrate the wins of course. Right. But you can't sit on those laurels for that extra minute because someone is, is looking to, to exploit, uh, as you said, the latest innovation, the latest development, the latest uh, uh, new device or you name it. So uh, thanks for weighing in on that. All right. One of our favorite things to talk about here are the people, of course, the people, the people, the people. And I've heard it said, you know, in this era of digital transformation, and I cannot remember Nadia. So Nadia, if you're listening, uh, previous guest, I, I, I want to attribute this quote correctly. She really dispelled the notion around digital transformation that it's not machines transforming. It's the humans leading the digital transformation. That's a good point because sometimes you talk, you know, we talk technology and, and, and people can be, kind of let on the sidelines of the conversation, but they are front and center and they're, they're critical to all that we do. So during your time in the U.S. Navy, speaking to people, who are some of the favorite folks that you, that you had the good fortune of working with? Oh my gosh. I mean, there are just hundreds and, you know, I, I will, I will call it a few specifically that I've considered just super mentors. I mean, I, I recently made a list of mentors that I included in a book I wrote, and it was probably 200 names. I mean, because wow. you know what, what happens is like, you know, when you're a kid and you're riding a bicycle and you're learning how to ride a bike and your mom and dad are helping you or somebody in your family's helping you and you're riding and you're like, look at me, I'm riding the bike. I'm so cool. I'm doing this all by myself. <laughs> Meanwhile, your mom's like snow plowing all these obstacles out of your way in front of you. Your dad's holding the back of the bike until you're stable enough. So I've had that kind of support my whole career. And a lot of times you don't even know that people are doing that for you. I mean, I, I, there are probably a thousand more people who I don't even know went out of their way to help me. And just, I didn't even know it. They, they were just generous and kind of heart and, um, and helped me out and, and didn't look for recognition for that or any acknowledgement of that. And that's the sign of a really good mentor and a really good leader is someone who's just trying to make other people more successful than themselves. You know what I mean? And so 
um, you know, some people I would call out specifically, um, you know, Admiral uh, uh, Fox Fallon, Bill Fallon, who has been a mentor to me forever, and he's just wonderful. And Monica Shepard, um, a civilian, government civilian, you know, she really taught me how to think, not what to think, how to think. You know, that's a different kind of thing. You know, um, Master Chief Terry Parham, Master Chief David Byrd, Jeffrey Price, Master Chief. Um, you know, I've had in, enlisted folks um, down to the lowest level who who were mentors to me, like in technology areas that, you know, they would take time and sit and go through things with me that um, uh, I didn't know, understand, whatever. And so there's just, I just, Sue Higgins, um, you know, there's people who were mentors to me who were like moms as well. And they kind of helped me figure out how do you balance being a mom with being a Navy officer and having a career where you're, you're traveling like and gone and in, in, in uncertain and dangerous areas and things like that. And so, and my husband too, I will give a lot of credit to my husband because, you know, he's always, there's always gotta be somebody around to, who tells the emperor they have no clothes, right? And calls a spade a spade. And my husband is just the kindest, gentlest man. And, uh, but he will tell me when I am um, being rude or not, using my words carefully enough because you know I just sometimes I'm the the bull in the china shop you know what I mean and so he'll 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 keep me in check I love that I think on that last note uh of course military members that active duty, act uh, all the members go active duty guard you name it all serve but what oftentimes isn't thought about especially for folks who maybe don't have military experience is their families are truly serving right Right. And those are big sacrifices that are made on so many different levels uh, so, so that uh, our, our soldiers and airmen and, and Marines and, and all, all of them can, can faithfully discharge their duties. Now that, that you, and, and I love your anecdote. I'm going to blatantly steal it, uh, Admiral Barrett, uh, the, the uh, riding the bike. That is such a wonderful anecdote for mentorship. You know, you got the snow plow in the front and you got to steady as it goes, support in the back. And oftentimes you're looking around everything else other than the people that are clearing the path and are, you know, got you in their, in their hands. So Spot I love on. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's talk, let's shift gears. And, and uh, uh, I surmise from my handful of experiences hearing you speak, you're not big of touting your own accomplishments and what you've done. It's all about the team. It's kind of what I, I've gathered. However, you know, I think all of us, as humble as some of us are, um, there's a couple of points of recognition during our careers um, that really we beam with pride and we think about, and we tell our kids about, it's always that, that front of mind thing. So in a career like yours, uh, which had no shortage of accomplishments and recognition, what's, what's one thing that you really point to that you're really proud of? Well, um, I would say it might be kind of obvious, but making Admiral, I mean, was huge for me. I mean, I, it wasn't like I was so like dead center because there's so many factors that go into making flag officer that are way, way beyond your control, right? Um, but what I will say is, um, again, people looking out for me because the day my selection board met, there's probably, you know, 20 officers who had equally or better records than mine and the wind just happened to blow my way that day. You know what I mean? And if it had been a different day, it had been a different officer and they would have done just as well or better. And so to me, but that was a really special moment for me and a really exciting moment because I, I felt like, okay, hey, now I'm given the opportunity to do more things at a higher level to impact the Navy, to change the Navy. And, and I used my time as an admiral to push really hard to, to transform the Navy and the digital transformation in the Navy. I felt that was really, really important to get our information warfare platform transformed. So I spent all my time as a flag officer working at Cybercom or lit my second job there as a flag out in the Pentagon trying to make sure that you know our information warfare platform was the best most secure most transformative thing that we could have and that's that's hard because there's a lot of institutional resistance and inertia and you know all that kind of stuff and you just have to kind of plow through that as best you can and and that hopefully I did that but I will tell you one thing that I always tell people who are retiring and or who are um, maybe disappointed that they didn't make the rank that they thought they should have or could have right? Because everybody at some point gets told, thanks for your service, you can go home now, right? And so you have to be good with that and you have to be ready for that. And, and, and sometimes people get really down if they thought, well, I should have made, you know, gunnery sergeant or I should have made, mm. uh, you know, master chief or I should have made admiral or captain or whatever. And I didn't, you know, and, and so now I'm a big failure, right? So they, they kind of get really down on themselves. But I say, 
you know, don't judge your success by your terminal pay grade. I never did. If I had never made Admiral, I would have still been happy to retire as a captain or commander or whatever, you know, and, and uh, because the, to me, the, the most rewarding moments and the measure of your success is like when somebody comes up to you in the PX or the Navy exchange or a store or something, they say, Hey, you probably don't remember me, but you know, I worked for you at this command and you're the reason I stayed in the Navy. You did this for me and you won't even remember you did that. Sort of like the plowing away, you know, that we talked about for somebody else. You do that probably as a leader a hundred times a day, different things for different people and you will forget that, but they won't. And, you know, so when somebody comes up to you and says something like that, you change that person's life and you didn't even know you did it. Or maybe you do remember, you know, maybe it was significant. But those kind of moments are really what are the seminal moments and the moments that characterize your leadership and your success, not your terminal pay grade. So, so anyway, when you look at the things that I find most important or special, I really still enjoy to this day. So people will still, if I'm in a Navy town, sometimes just someone will come up to you and say, oh, hey, I used to work for you. You know what I mean? And, and this is what you did. And I remember that or something. So that's kind of the stuff that I find most important. Love that. I love that. Um, all right. So the day that you found out that you made rear admiral or promoted up from captain, what'd you do? Uh, I stayed at work. <laughs> I mean, I called my family and my husband, obviously. And, and, you know, when you find out, you kind of find out a little ahead of time before the official list is out. So you're not really supposed to talk about, it, which is really hard because you want to just be like calling all your friends and everything like that or whatever. But, but yeah, you know, I called my immediate family and, and they were of course thrilled for me and really excited for me. Love that. And there's probably other, other ways you celebrate it. We can't go into publicly. Right? Well, <laughs> I would say I probably I had a point, point of hog and dust that day. Probably, it's probably true. Yeah. My point. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's talk about, uh, but before we talk, we're going to talk transition in a minute, which is usually a big, big uh, theme in these conversations because it just, it, it's, um, it's really consumed the military um, and folks that have been separating, retiring, or just exiting here in the last well, I mean, it seems like forever. Transition is one of those things we've talked about. But before we do, let's talk about something far easier. Favorite places. I bet, um, I think I saw you quoted somewhere uh, that you said that off, often recite a quote. You know, they say you, you'll see the world if you join the Navy, and you did. So on all of your travels, and I'm sure you saw plenty of gorgeous and fun and beautiful places, but what's, what's one or two that were really special to you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're right. Join the Navy and see the world. You're not kidding. I mean, it's probably been about 80 countries because since I joined the Navy and some of them aren't ones that you would like pick, like Iraq and Haiti weren't high on my list. But I even in those places, you know, the sky in Iraq at night with no light is the most beautiful sky I've ever seen. You know, Haiti, the people in Haiti, um, I was down there for uh, relief operations after the last earthquake. Um, it's, it was horrible devastation, horrible mess, but the people were so wonderful and beautiful and resilient, you know what I mean, and in kind and no one, everybody helped each other out, you know, no one went crazy with food rides and things like that. So, I mean, those kind of things are wonderful. When it came to just sort of sightseeing, um, I loved Bali. I was on a ship that pulled into Bali and what a beautiful place and New Zealand and, uh, and we lived in Bahrain for um, two years. My daughter was actually born there. And I loved hearing the call to prayer in the morning. I mean, I hadn't had exposure to the Muslim culture and uh, I just found it fascinating and beautiful. And uh, so again, you can find beauty anywhere you go in the world. Um, and I tried to do that. Well said. All right. So now let's, let's shift gears over to transition. And, and you know, uh, if you could speak a little bit about your transition uh, as you departed the U.S. Navy and kind of entered you know, things you're doing now, keynoting, consulting, serving on boards of directors. Um, but if you could also kind of along the same time, any lessons that you learned and any other really practical transition advice you might offer our listeners who may be uh, enduring their own transition or getting ready to right at this minute. Yeah, sure. I think the two big points I would make is um, uh, the first one is be good with your transition. Don't again, look back and say, oh, I wish I'd done this, or I wish I'd made this rank, or wish this had happened, or they're telling me to go home, or whatever, you know, be good with moving on, and leave it behind, right, and it doesn't mean you leave your friends behind, it means you leave it behind, don't dwell on it, don't be like, hey, this is what I did at band camp, right, you know, don't be that guy, <laughs> you know, so, or gal, so just be good with it, and, and, and make a break, 
because the people that linger and linger in the past and, and keep that up, they just are constantly disappointed that the civilian world isn't what the military world, it isn't. And it's not gonna be, it's never gonna be. It's gonna be different, better, something, a new challenge, a new opportunity for you. So look at it that way. Most of the people I know are excited about moving on and doing something else just because, you know, the military life is difficult and um, it requires a lot of sacrifice, particularly with your family. And so the second point I would make is, is you're not promised tomorrow. So you have to carpe diem. I mean, I've always been kind of a carpe diem kind of gal, even when I was in the military. I mean, I don't wait to do anything because I can be you know, hit by a bus tomorrow, right? But it was really brought home to me when I was two years ago, I had a heart attack and I was only 51. I was not that old. And okay, that's years of bad eating and probably hereditary and just a whole bunch of stress and a whole bunch of stuff. But, you know, uh, the point is that after that, I, um, you know, I, I really made sure that I, my carpe diem philosophy continued, particularly in retirement. So for example, I planned fun first, right? Now I have to go to my board meetings. Those are, you know, you're not going to miss a board meeting, but you know, when I get an opportunity to be an extra in a movie, I block that whole day off. Right. And, you know, my husband's, you know, we put him into, so maybe we can do it together. It's kind of something fun. And I don't care if there's other consulting money that would pay more than $170 a day, which it does. You know what I mean? I mean, that's like, you know, kind of nothing when you think about it in the big scheme of things. Right. But it's not there for the money. You're there to have fun and do something different. Or I, you know, I, I make sure we, I do things like go, go, go for walks with my husband or hikes with my husband every single day and things like that. You, you got to put in the stuff that matters and don't be just chasing after a paycheck or a job or whatever, because, you know, you know, you may think you have all this time, but you may not. And you want to spend it with the people you love, because at the end of the day, that's what really matters is the people and the relationships. It's not how much money you make, how big your house is, what your car is, you know, what your position or title is. I mean, I would get rid of all my work today if I didn't enjoy it. You know, I'm only doing stuff that I enjoy and working for people I enjoy. And you know, one of the other things is, you know, I had some great advice from a, um, a leader when I was getting out of a retired flag officer. He's like, hey, you don't have to work for, he is a different term, but jerks, right? It, I mean, <laughs> you can choose not to work for those people anymore, right? No one's going to tell you who you have to work. So make choices that'll bring you joy and bring joy to your family and friends. You know. I, I love that. And, and, you know, I, I never really thought about that. Now, when I was in the military and I, I got out in 02, so it's been a little while. Uh, I completely have forgotten whoever your boss was, whoever you reported to, that was going to be your boss or your manager. You don't, in, in the private side, you don't have to worry about that. Life's too short for jerks and yeah. you can work for who you want to oftentimes. So uh, love that advice. Uh, and also you know, stopping and smelling the roses is, is so important. You know, closing down email and turning the phone off and, and taking a mental break, regardless of what you do from all the, the stressors because it follow you know, un unlike you know, in this wonderful age of technology and in the, in the information age, uh, it follows you home. It follow you know, from office. And I know the office is at home these days, but still, you know, as you walk mm -hmm. out of the room, that is your office. You, we all, we oftentimes have our email, social, you name it. Uh, and it just follows us wherever we go. We got to take those, those, those important breaks. Yeah. Um, Especially during, like you said, during COVID people have blurred home and office now make it distinct, cut it off, mm. you know, at a certain point just stop because honestly, most of it's BS. And if nobody's going to die, if you don't do it, it's really not that important. So let's yeah. put it in perspective. You know? Wonderful perspective. Okay. So, so tell us a little bit before we're going to talk about your book here in a minute, rock the boat, which I love. And um, I love some of your perspective related to the book, but what, what are you doing now? Tell us where do you spend your time now beyond uh, crossing the street in, in big time movie productions. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that, but it's fun anyway. <laughs> Dumpy lady crossing street number two. It's, it's a, someone's got to do that job, right? <laughs> Taking one for the team. No. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I do, uh, sit on some, as an independent director on a couple boards, two banks and, a, another company, and I do consulting and things like that. And it's mostly related to digital transformation, cybersecurity, I do speaking uh, engagements and things like that. And also a lot of veterans speaking kind of things and with veterans groups like Doris and stuff like that. And Brian Arrington's uh, Vets to Industry. Um, and then, um, uh, like I said, uh, I do some writing, writing articles with friends, um, mostly technical cybersecurity, information operations articles and things like that. And then I wrote the book uh, uh, because, and I wrote the book honestly, because you know, I was never like, 
dying to be an author or anything like that. But I just found over the years that people asked me, I used to speak a lot about mentoring to groups about mentoring and how to be a good mentor and things like that. And sometimes things that seem obvious to me are, are not, or to other leaders aren't as obvious to everybody else. And so when I say so easy, a monkey can do it. It is so easy, a monkey can do it. But sometimes you have to realize you have to think about it, you know, and you have to really think about, okay, well, yeah, why don't I just, do that? it doesn't have to be this complicated. Let's not make this harder than it needs to be. Right. Um, so anyway, when I wrote the book, it was kind of a, a kind of a um, amalgam of things that people had taught me great leadership mentoring I've had over the years from folks like I, like uh, that are listed in the book, but that we talked about a couple of them here today and, you know, how you can pass that along to somebody else. And so I was just trying to pass along really great leadership that I'd gotten from others. Um, and you know, kind of melded into my own style, like as a big glob, I'm picking all the best pieces. And, you know, you pick some of the worst too. And you say, okay, I'm never going to treat somebody like that. Right. And so um, you, you glob that all together. And then I thought, well, I'll just write it all down in a book because, you know, people ask me a lot still to this day for the same kind of advice. I thought, well, I'll just put it out there. And if people are interested, they'll read it. And if not, that's okay too. Well, um, let, let's talk. So the book you're talking about is Rock the Boat. And I think it's coming out in June. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it'll be available uh, wherever you get your favorite books from. Um, so what's behind the name? Yeah, so um, it's interesting because I had originally, when I sent it to the publisher, I had a different name. It was um, Mentoring Leadership So Easy a Monkey Could Do It, right? And they were like, mm, I don't know if we want to say that. I'm like, well, it is. That is the truth. I mean, it really sets the tone for the book that, you know, this is not like a heavy tone. You're not going to find like big, heavy leadership um four mathematical formulas in here. And yeah, you know, some books get like that. It drives me insane. I just want practical advice that I can use right now. You know, and, and the book has a lot of stories in it, like we told today, like, because I think that I always, always found like, I'll remember a story long after the leadership lesson is gone, but I right. take the leadership lesson out of the story, right? And so anyway, the publisher suggested like, I don't know, five or six titles. And that one just jumped out at me. They That was one they actually suggested. I'm like, okay, I love that because it's got the Navy element. And it is kind of how I think, you know, I think you need to turn things up a little bit um, to get progress and to, to transform and to change. And part of the book is about how you embrace change as a leader and stuff. So I thought that was brilliant, but I have to give credit to my publisher on the title. So Love it. And you do indeed need to rock the boat these days, regardless of your role, right? Right. Absolutely. Um, that, that's how we get, we have breakthroughs and innovation and, um, and, you know, uh, provide opportunity for all, right? D despite whatever walk yeah. of life you, you come from and, and provide opportunities for advancement. So I love that. I really do. I look forward to getting a copy and reading through it. Um, along the same lines, we've talked a lot about Vets to Industry today. I'm a big fan. Brian Arrington and uh, Vets to Industry. I mean, you talk, the other theme of this conversation has been real practical stuff, right? Practical resources, practical mm -hmm. advice. Well, I'll tell you, it doesn't get much more practical than seeing a need and, and finding a way to connect it with a resource. You know, we've had folks that uh, have been homeless, unfortunately, veteran families, yeah. been homeless for a couple months. And through Vets to Industry, they found a way to get back into a home. I mean, that is talk about That's wonderful amazing. stories. Um, yeah. I heard you. So at, at that keynote, you shared the advice, avoid the like me trap. Can you, can you expound on that a little bit more for our listeners here? Yeah, sure. So, you know, when we look to be diverse and inclusive, um, it's hard sometimes because we all grew up with un unconscious bias and hidden biases and stuff that are formed over years from our experience, our upbringing, our environment, where we live, you know, all that kind of stuff. And um, uh, that when you, when you want to get your leadership team together, if you're just picking people who are just like you, who think just like you, who look just like you, who act just like you, um, who make you comfortable because they reinforce what you think and don't challenge you to think a different way, then you're not going to grow. You're not going to have the best solution. You're not going to have um, transformational success. You know what I mean? Like we talked about. Um, you may be successful, but not as successful as you could be. And it requires leaders to be strong and vulnerable and take risk and be uh, able to look at somebody else and not stereotype them and give them the opportunity to speak and, the, and listen to what they're saying and incorporate those ideas, right? And so people who pick the like me, I've found usually un, 
first of all, they lack self-esteem because they don't like to be challenged and they think every challenge is a personal attack on them or their idea. They associate their idea too closely with themselves, right? It's not about you, <laughs> okay? It's about an organization. It's about a mission or whatever. So let's remove that first of all. If you can do that, and then and then the other piece too is I found that leaders who surround themselves with people just like them, it's because again, they don't like to be challenged for whatever reason. And they they want somebody to just reinforce what they're already thinking. And that's a that's a self-looking ice cream cone. That's a dead end. And it's certainly not anything that we need out of a change agent or a leader today. Well said. Well said. Um, um, so, so one quick follow-up question. Uh, cause unconscious bias, I'm a big, I, I completely agree with you. I've had some great coaches and mentors here in the last 10 years that really helped uncover what that means and what that means in my own journey. Right. Cause it, these blind spots that we all have. And, um, it's, it's I still find amazing. And, and, uh, Adam Barrett, I've given up arguing on Facebook and LinkedIn and all social because nothing ever happens, but there are some folks that just are adamant that it does not exist. And that's, that's unfortunate. And we've got to break through with all those folks, but they're the problem, right? That, exactly. That, right. They are the unconscious walking, unconscious bias, right? Right. And that, and, and what raises the stakes in the information age, uh, we talked a lot about in the front of this, of this interview is with uh, AI, you know, artificial intelligence and how that's, how that's constructed and the code that goes into that and the dangers. And, and, and fortunately there's a lot smarter people like you and, and others that are you know, putting together groups to, to tackle this stuff that, that know I am anything but a technologist and I don't know, <laughs> coding is not my thing, my, my gift, but how can we overcome unconscious bias so that AI doesn't even further um, mm -hmm. do more damage, it could. right? Because yeah. it, it's proliferating. Yeah. Every, I mean, you said it yourself, a great example, the kitchen, your, your <laughs> refrigerators are connected to things. That's so right. it's touching all, all aspects of, of human life yeah. and the humanity journey. Speak to that, if you would, for a second. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a great study. I can't remember who did it, but it was a study of the unconscious bias that AI can have in big data. And how it worked was there was um, a language translation program that translated English to Turkish, Turkish back to English, right? And in Turkish, apparently they use the same pronoun for male, female. So they don't have like a male version or female version of the pronoun, right? And so going in, the, the, the going in proposition was John is a nurse, right? Got translated into Turkish. When it came back out of Turkish to English, it said Joan is a nurse. Because obviously John's a guy, he mm. couldn't be a nurse, right? Mm. Well, how does that happen, right? It was the algorithm that the AI developer wrote for that, that had the unconscious bias that a man is can't be a nurse or isn't a nurse okay and so it's really interesting you know they say you know your ai uh, it matters where your ai went to school right and it's true and so that is something that people who program um artificial intelligence need to be really super conscious of their potential biases and, and that's the problem with unconscious biases they're unconscious you don't know right. you have them and so you have to have discussions about what could those look like? What might those be? So developers should have almost like, uh, you know, anthropologists with them. You know, I, I often find it in, in, intriguing that uh, I think it was General Petraeus used to have an anthropologist on his staff because he said, my problem is not a technical problem. It's not a military problem. It's a cultural problem, right? It's like, how do I understand the culture in Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever he happened to been fighting wars and stuff and understand the tribal differences and all those kind of things, right? It's the same thing with how we program technology and use technology and how it can be uh, skewed a certain way based on some bias. So it requires extra effort and the ability to look beyond the technology to the process, people, training, awareness, all that other stuff that goes into making it a successful capability or solution or change uh, driver. Well said. You know. In this uh, age we live in, and, and not just technology, but but uh, across industry, we're all highly focused on the outputs and outcomes. However, I would submit to you that in the years ahead, it's going to be incredibly more important to focus a lot more on the inputs, the inputs, mm -hmm. the inputs, getting those the inputs, right, and getting yeah. those right. That's right. Yeah. Um, so thanks so much for speaking on that. Let's make sure folks know how to connect 
with you, Admiral Barrett. Uh, I, I really appreciate kind of your approach of your POV, how, just how much practicality you have there. Love the book. I'm about to dive into the book. Uh, I know you, uh, you stay busy, but how can folks connect with you and, and, and where will they be able to find the book? Yeah, so the book is available for pre-order um, on Amazon right now and a couple other sites, and uh, it'll be available in ebook and um, uh, audio book in about a month, too, for order. Um, but you can just find it if you did Rock the Boat and Danelle Barrett on Amazon, you'd be able to find it that way. Um, the other way you can connect with me is I have a couple, I have an Instagram site, a Twitter feed, and a, um, a Facebook group called Mentoring with the Admiral. And um, on that site, I post on, particularly on the Facebook site, it's more friendly to text, but I, I post uh, daily mentoring nuggets um, there. So every single day, there's a new little mentoring nugget. And I also post them on LinkedIn. So you can find me on LinkedIn or I have a website, um, DanelleBarrett.com. And um, you can always uh, email me or connect with me on any of those sites. Wonderful. Check that out. Uh, because if you like this interview, you're going to love those daily nuggets, I'm sure. So I'm, I'm going to depart and sign up for that right away. <laughs> Mentoring with the Admiral. Love that. Well, huge thanks. We've been talking with New United States Navy Rear Admiral retired Danelle Barrett. Really appreciate your time. Congratul uh, first off, appreciate all of your service. Uh, congratulations on all these projects you've got cooking. And we look forward to big things uh, to come. And we'll have to have you back on and put our finger on the pulse of all your, your uh, great POV again real soon. Well, thanks for the opportunity to talk to the group and for the group out there, all your service, whether you're family member or the actual military member or government civilian, it's all service. So thank you very much. Amen. All right, Admiral Barrett, thanks so much. Hey, on behalf of the entire team here at Veteran Voices, hopefully you've enjoyed this conversation as much as we have. Uh, uh, stay tuned. We got season three. This 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 conversation is part of season three. We're releasing in spring 2021. We got a lot of outstanding interviews, just like this one, all teed up and ready to go. Uh, you can find us and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from. Find us on social, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Hey, and if you're a veteran, you've got a, a story to tell. Reach out and we'll see if we can't work you into production. Of course, be sure to check out our partners at vets2industry.com. They need your support. They're a nonprofit that are really practically moving the needle for our veteran community that's to industry.com on behalf of our entire team here scott luton signing off for now hey do good give forward be the change that's needed be just like admiral barrett and on that note we'll see you next time here at veteran voices thanks everybody